everyone. Okay, we are recording. Welcome, everybody. It's another session of Open Tech Convo. Um, I am just sitting on a low today, <laughs> facilitating, um, but we have our host, Umi Jawo. Um, I am just an uh, ITC consultant, so, so small timer. Uh, and um, I will let Umi uh, Jawo and all the panelists today uh, introduce themselves, um, and then we'll get the conversation started. Uh, remember, after introductions, it's straight to Q&A. So I'm going to go ahead and mute myself, and um, wherever I'm needed, I'll be right back on. So thank you all again for joining us and welcome to the conversation. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Sarin. Um, as he said, I'm, I'm Omi um, and I'll be doing some of the driving with my girls here. There's Harriet and Miriam. Um, happy to call them my friends. So today we're going to be talking about um, basically Gambian women in technology. Uh, so as you all know, it's a minority to be black in technology, a minority to be immigrant in technology, a minority to be a woman in technology. And then these girls here are like, you know, how dare they? A minority of a minority of a minority. So we are here to talk about how we got there, um, answer questions from um, the audience, and basically just have an informal discussion on how um, other people who want to be in this position or in other positions or get in, their foot in, in the door in technology, any questions they have, we can help answer. Um, so I guess I can lead the way and just give a brief introduction of myself. Again, I'm Omi. Um, I'm currently a senior software engineer at Microsoft. Um, I have had about 10 years of experience in this field. I worked at various companies, different types of fields. I've done consulting, tech consulting. Um, so before this, I um, was a consultant at Facebook. Um, before that, I was um, a consultant at, I don't know, I'm like forgetting most of my resume, but let's just, let's just say, um, yeah, been doing this for a while. Super enjoyed doing this and um, looking forward to like answering any questions you guys have about my career or anything personal. Thanks. So who wants to start? Yum, Harriet? I'll go, right. I guess. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm Harriet um, Ashcroft. Um, I currently work for Netflix. Um, I've been a software engineer for about eight years now. Um, I didn't start off in this field. Um, my degree is actually in the biological sciences, specifically, um, I have a bachelor's in biology and then a master's in pharmaceutical sciences. Um, so I switched into tech um, pretty far in, <laughs> um, but I really love it. Um, I highly recommend it for those who are interested. So that's kind of why I'm here. Thanks, Harriet. Yeah. I guess I got next. Um, so yeah, I'm Yam. I am. Um, I currently work as a hardware operations engineer um, with Google. Um, basically, work in our third-party data centers. So data centers not owned by Google. Just um, spaces we're running out um, here in Los Angeles. Um, I've been in this position about a year, three months now. Um, and prior to that, I worked with Google in a variety of positions as an IT apprentice, an IT intern for a couple of times, um, and a corporate operations engineer on contract, and now um, working um, as a full-timer. Um, so I've been in this field about five, six years, I think. The math is not that good, but you get the gist. Um, so yeah, um, it's 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 definitely an honor to be on this panel with these amazing, amazing um, women. And yeah, looking forward to this chat. Awesome, thank you, Yum. Um, so as you can see, we have like uh, different people at different companies and who took different paths to be there. So. I guess right now we're going to open the floor to questions.
All right. While they're thinking about questions, um, Yam, do you want to talk Hello. to? Hi, Menge. Yes. So my daughter is making a lot of noise in the background. Let me run. That's um, fine. Quick I, I one. Mine out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for um for taking time off of your busy schedules to join. Sorry, I just joined in. But yeah, um, this question is going to Mariam Kamara. Um, I joined UTG back in 2011. I've and I've and I've seen you around in the campus. I know you were <laughs> you were definitely my senior. I don't know what year you graduated, but given the fact that now you're working for Google, um, if you if if you went to the university you know like the whole stereotype about like graduating from a gambian university i just wanted to know how was your journey um from gambia transitioning into you know you know the u.s corporate world you're on mute yeah this is actually something i always do never mind me but um i was saying that i wasn't expecting that to be my first question but um <laughs> Thank you, Mange. Um, uh, so I didn't graduate UTG. <laughs> um, I started out in medical school. Yeah, so I did pre-med um, and then I switched to um, a nursing degree. But then I came to the States, I think, in my second year. Um, so essentially, I dropped out. Um, and when I came here, um, I started out with a liberal arts degree. I think. Yes. So um, I started out with a liberal arts degree and I think like I only did a semester of that. And um, basically uh, awesome that sitting is on this chat. So um, uh, after a couple of years, <laughs> after a couple of years of um, just being here and just, you know, trying to settle in and all that, um, I started getting really bored. Um, at some point, I remember speaking to Sering about it. Basically, I just need um, something intellectually challenging or something. And he suggested I learn how to code. Um, and that's basically how I started in tech. Um, just got a computer and started learning how to code online, um, mentored by Sering um, and, and, and um, couple other people uh so yeah through the years i've um i've done a few like um i i started out at google through an it program um it's called the year program um and basically it's like a six months in class like training and like, like tech support and then doing a six month apprenticeship with um uh, a corporate company and basically that's how i got matched with google so I did an apprenticeship and then they offered me an official internship to return. Um, that came with a scholarship, of course. So um, I started out um, uh, with an, trying to get an associate's degree in computer science, but in grand style, I dropped out. Um, and um, basically I, oh, I, I left Google for a while and worked with um, like a, a startup um, for a bit in New York, and then I came back to Google in a contractor position, and then once that contract ended, like a year, some couple of months ago, um, I converted into this full-time role. So basically, for the most part, I'm self-taught, mentored, call it whatever, but yeah, don't have a degree from UCG. So um, I think Harriet actually mentioned something earlier in the chat, which that you don't need math to do tech. And there's so many myths about tech, um, you know, that stop people from pursuing it um, without a degree. Of course, there's some there's some roles that, you know, definitely need a degree or some kind of formal education, but it's not the only way into tech. Um, there are a lot of valid ways into tech. Um, and yeah, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, just a follow up question from there. Um, <clears throat> I know that not a lot of people have a sitting on their corner um, <laughs> to do like a full mentorship for you to have a <laughs> to you for you to have a clear role to Google. Um, but just for the fact, um, because I'm I'm hoping that this is recorded, and because I know there's a lot of Gambian 
um, students in the university that are pursuing computer science is actually more women are actually going into computer science now. Um, given the fact that you kind of understand because you started out in at UTG, I know the times are a little different. Um, do you, what can you advise as a Claire Road that students can actually take to be able to make their way to Fortune 500 companies or you know, some a role as challenging as what you're currently doing? Do you think it is a reality for a UTG graduate, honestly? I think it absolutely is a reality. It, does, it doesn't, um, it does not, not come with its challenges, of course. Um, but I, I do think it is a reality, especially now with um, how, um, you know, everyone's trying to diversify the workforce. Um, you know, people, c companies are trying to, you know, just come into Africa. You know, they, they, you know, they need to hit some kind of market there. They would need, you know, people living in the area to work on, 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 on you know, products and teams and whatever that would bring a unique perspective to, to, to their company. So I think um, we, it is, a, it, it is a reality for me. I think one of the most important things I've learned um, just going through this journey has been to, to find out how you learn best. Um, for me, that's, that's, that was the key to it. Um, so someone like Serena, like Serena, Serena, um, can like be a pretty hands-off mentor. So, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 my, my, my journey into, um, that year of program that I mentioned actually started very funnily from a friend in Gambia. So I had mentioned to my friends that I was in tech, I was learning how to code and all of that, even the friends who aren't, um, in tech and someone in Gambia saw someone post about this program in Seattle and they took a screenshot because they just knew, you know, they, they don't care about the tech or whatever. And they just knew it was something I was interested in. Um, and they sent it to me. They were like, hey, I think this is something you should check out. And that's that's basically how I got to Google. Um, that was like my direct path through Google, right? So um, I think, I think, there is val value in like having like a support um, system, um, whether it be people who are, you know, in that field that you're pursuing or just friends who care about you in general, because, you know, people will be saying your names in places that you're, you're not, but people have to know that these are things that you're interested in and things that you um, want to do. So like another, another tip would be networking. Um, networking is definitely one of the, um, like, I lost for words for that, but it, it, it's very vital when it comes to, when it comes to, when, you know, when it comes to getting into corporate America, like, it, it, it would be easier for you to get an interview, say, at, like, a Fortune 500 company if you got referred versus if you applied from, like, the website. So, things like that, like, and it doesn't have to be someone who's in a role like you know in tech it could be someone say you have a friend who's in the sales department of that company and they could still refer you so like there are various ways um to that yeah okay i have a counter question i guess from menge uh, um why do you think that whatever coursework uh, 500 companies. Sorry. What do you think Gambians are learning that, for instance, Sorry, somebody who's I going heard, to like, the only... Harriet, I can didn't you... hear your whole question. You were uh, for a sec. The, the okay. network in Panama didn't want the whole question to come through. Looks like Harriet is having some. Hello? Issues. Yeah. We're barely hearing you. It's cutting Harry? off. No. Okay, hold on. All right. It could be the AirPods are running out of battery. Um, that sometimes yeah. happens. Yeah. She's on vacation in South America, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Living Can you hear me? Life. Yeah, so that's, that's not helping. <laughs> No, sorry. Is that better? Probably it's turning off your um, video. Yeah. My help. Yeah. 
Is that better? Hello? Wait, say yep. that again. That's perfect, yeah. Okay. Hello, I right. am back, sorry. Okay, so my counter question to you, Menge, was, um, why do why that particular question, right? Like, why do you? Because to me personally, it sounds like you feel that a UTG education is somehow uh, lacking or, or inadequate to get you into the door of a Fortune 500 company in the United States. So I guess my question to you is. Why do you feel that somebody with a degree from UTG um, somehow doesn't have what it takes versus somebody who comes from an institution from any other part of the world, including the United States? Oh, okay. Um, my question is actually um, from experience because I myself, I'm a UTG graduate. I've never studied outside of the Gambia. Um, and I've been able to do okay for myself, I, I, I think. But however, it is still a myth within young Gambians that our education is on the standard. So I always take these opportunities when I see Gambians, even though there are like multiple of examples of, 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 of fantastic young Gambians who graduated from the university, who are now lecturers in international universities, who've made it to um, the likes of Columbia University and, and so on. And we, like we, we still have those stories, but within the youth, especially those that have just recently graduated, they just feel like a UTG, grad, uh, a UTG graduate is below standard. I don't know, it could be because the campuses look ugly. We don't have, <laughs> we don't have, um, and, and most most of the students that actually excel, uh, you know, they put in the extra effort, but I think it's the same across any university in the in the globe. Um, but this is, this is a myth that young people have, and even some people that are within the university systems. I've had, you know, uh, some university students like reach out to me asking for scholarship opportunities, and they're already enrolled. They're like, oh, it's my course, being a little known, I don't know how to out, you know? And so, like, I, I, oh, that's why I'm asking this question because I, I know that um, I, I wasn't sure if my um, um, ended up graduating from UTG, but I know that when, when I came in, I, I used to see her around campus because she had a very unique look with the she she somehow she maintained it that's fantastic because <laughs> you can never forget the thing it's like she always had the big headphones and it, she just looked cool and that was why like when i when i saw her image it, it just clicked i was like oh you know when i came in she was here and now knowing that she's she's in google i just wanted to take the opportunity to, to ask like was she a graduate and how was the journey out so that you know because this 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 um you know this this event is recorded um, university students, if they listen to it later, they would understand that you know, graduating from the University of Gambia doesn't mean your 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 degree is, is less than. Wherever you aim, you can actually get there. Because myself, I'm a graduate. I've never left the country, but anywhere I stand and speak, they just like, "How do I a jange?" You know, and I I I don't think it's a compliment. I actually I feel it isn't insulted. a compliment. That isn't a compliment. It isn't. <laughs> yeah, um, I think yeah. first and foremost. Yeah. And First and foremost, um, this is, I think this is an issue that as Gambians, we need to address holistically because we somehow always have this complex about not being enough. And, and it's a complex that like, it won't serve you in Gambia and it certainly won't serve you anywhere else that you go, right? Because the complex just carries over no matter what location you're in. Right. Like if you don't feel like you're enough or good enough to like work for Google, if you don't feel like you're good enough in Gambia, like, like you're not going to feel good enough when you come to the United States. So I think a career in tech is more about your like Mariam has already said, it's about like your training. Right. Like it's it doesn't even matter what your education is like. I have a degree in biology. It doesn't really serve me much here unless I'm in the healthcare space or whatever. So it's more about your training and you can get that training no matter what part of the world you come from. You can get it in Gambia and those same skills are transferable here as well. I know some of like some of some of the 
best software engineers were in Gambia. Like, and uh, like if you know, if you ever wanted to, you know, sometimes it's a matter of choice. If you ever wanted to, easy you could work in 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 um, corporate America in in any of these big companies. Like, uh, and I totally agree with 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 what you said, um, Harriet, about that. And I think that's that's a very deep rooted. Um, thing in our culture that yeah like you said we do need to speak about or you know in a holistic manner but yeah um yeah that's a whole that's a whole nother thing yeah harriet um so since you had your degree in biology um and you're now a software engineer at netflix what path did you take to get there um i think i took a similar path to mariam's in in some ways um I, I actually, I, I was chuckling earlier because um, I remember when I was in undergrad, Sedin tried to conv convince me to do my degree in uh, computer science. So clearly that's his agenda in this whole wide world is to just like make, turn everybody into like a mm -hmm. software engineer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I was mad, but mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I that's the that's the that. exact reason why I asked that question. I just wanted to highlight, um, you know, the work Sarin has been doing underground. So yeah. Joe, he's on the chat yeah. right now. Yeah, but go ahead, sorry. <laughs> no, I was gonna say I did not listen to him uh, at the time because I was just like, what? Go into tech? I'm not doing that. Like that sounds really boring. That sounds even worse than going to med school. Um, and at the time, that's what I was gonna do. Um. Then I got my bio degree and it was in like 2009. And if anybody remembers like what the United States was like at that time, like there were basically no jobs at all for graduates. So then my sister was like, you should go to grad school. I was like, okay, but then what am I gonna do in grad school? Um, <laughs> so I ended up getting a pharmaceutical science degree. And then as I was doing my um, thesis, I ended up working in a um, lab that was um, a computational chemistry lab. So, so a lot of my science coursework overlapped with technology and um, writing a lot of code um, and reading a lot of code that my mentor, my advisor at the time was, was writing. Um, so that's kind of how I got drawn in. Um, and then after I graduated, I decided to take up a position with um, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, um, where it was with on a project where they were essentially trying to um, create a tool to measure um, computational like sustainability. So like how green your decisions are as a as a company or as a, a grassroots organization at the time, like the the EPA was working with mostly grassroots organizations. And so they wanted to measure um, how the decisions they were making had impact on the environment. So I ended up working on that like tool. And then from there kind of got stuck in technology. So I've moved farther and farther away from science and deeper and deeper into other problem spaces. So that's kind of how I got here. So shout out to sitting. Yeah, shout out <laughs> he, to Siri. He was, uh, he was right. <laughs> definitely shout out to Siri. <laughs> yeah. So um, we have a few questions. Malaika has a question, but um, Siri had one earlier in the chat. He asked, what's the biggest difference you've noticed between working for smaller companies and tech giants? Does anybody want to take that? I can I can answer. All right, go go for it. Yeah, go for it. Um, well, my experience for, for like for the most part is limited. Um, like I I did the two extremes. There's like a startup and then a big company. Um, and um, for the most part, it's it's how fast paced the environment is, and you know how just how quickly just externally how. How quickly technology changes is basically, you know, just 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 as how just as quick as it changes internally. So you're just having to 
be kept on your toes and um and you know I was looking looking for new opportunities you know just to grow so you don't you don't you don't become like stagnant um uh for like the difference with the the smaller company was that um you know I I had to be a self starter for the most part whereas like for my role I was the first person for that company so you know I had to do a lot of like just self initiation of like you know creating documents um you know all that stuff um uh and and for for me the the most significant difference was the um the 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 pace of the environment basically um I, the the startup was a lot more laid back and you know I could take my time a lot of things but with a bigger company um it, there's so many working you know cause like so many different things you have to know um you know not just in addition to your tech skills there's so many other things like admin and you know people skills and like and just all that and just interacting with different teams and all that stuff so um yeah it's that's interesting cuz i i have the total opposite experience of what you um just mentioned i've worked for like um small companies where i'm like the one person tech person that does everything from networking to like coding and everything and then i've worked for like small companies like with 13 engineers what 5000 engineers what in the hundreds of thousands of engineers but it's like the total opposite for me at small companies i'm expected to be like multifaceted um know each bit of everything be able to communicate be able to like draw full flow charts be able to um program manage my own projects and run things at large companies i feel more like a cog in a wheel so I don't I I'm able to specialize more at larger companies because I'm able to say okay I I want to be uh, a UX engineer I'm going to solely focus on react and I'm able to do that because I know they hired other people with other specialties to do other things so it, it it's different vibes um uh, the benefits are different the people are different and everything but I I feel like large companies allow you to like specialize and you know you you have the opportunity to shine with just one, um, you know, being able to do, do just one thing, but you also have the opportunity to be lost in like the entire process and stuff. And there's also more red tapes, but with smaller companies, you also are able to own everything, but it's also on you if something goes south, everything goes south and that's all on you. So it's quite interesting. All so, right, my like, sorry, go I'll, ahead. Yep. I'll add to that. Can I add to that? Yeah, go um, for it. So I would also, I would agree with Omi. My experience has been similar there in that, like, there's more bureaucracy with bigger companies. Like, that's been my experience. So things tend to move slower, um, but you also have more opportunity to specialize. Um, the other difference for me, of course, is the money. Um, bigger companies <laughs> love it. <laughs> the bigger companies have more money, um, more resources. Um, startups are often on like financially rocky ground. Um, so it depends on like what stage in your career you're in. I think like when you're starting off, like you you're willing to take the risk of being at a start startup, but as like your career grows you want a company that's stable, has the resources to send you to workshops and trainings and like can can give you tuition reimbursement if you wanna go back to school, things like that. So, you know, those are all things to consider when you're trying to make that choice between a big company and a small company. Great, all right, Malika, what's your question? Hi, Umi. Thanks so hi. much. Um, hi, Mariam. Hi, Harriet. Um, so, so yeah, I, I'm going to just take 30 seconds to big you guys up just for a little bit because I'm so proud um, to see the three of you on this panel, not just because you're, you know, Gambian women in tech, but because, yeah, I have the, the privilege of having a little bit of insight into my sister's journey, um, and I suppose by proxy only yours, because you know I know that y'all were preparing quite a lot together. So you should be very proud of yourself um, for Thank your you. achievement. I think I think a lot of times people make a big deal out of women in tech, um, as if being a woman anywhere isn't hard enough. 
Um, so, so just just being a woman existing is an achievement, right? So, so you know, very well done, and and I hope you guys really do take time out to like celebrate yourselves and 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 enjoy what you achieve every day. Um, we truly having, appreciate that. <laughs> good, good. Having having said that, I think in in these conversations sometimes because panelists are super brilliant, um, you tend to oversimplify. The, the amount of work that goes into getting to where you are. Like, I, I believe my sister is the smartest human being in the world. And yet I saw how hard she had to work and study to get to this particular point in her journey, right? So, so I think sort of going back to Menga's question about, is it enough being a UTD grad? I think answering that question in a simplistic way can lose out the texture in actually how much you have to put in to get to where you are. And then the, the, the value in developing a new set of skills to thrive where you are, and then to continue to grow your ambition to get to the next stage, right? So, so talk to us a little bit about that, what it takes, what it's taken, and what it continues to require of you. That's, that's a really good question. That's something I actually wanted to talk about later, the entire interview process, because as, you said, and you've been witness to this, it's it's not an easy process at all. And back to Manga's question, it's not even enough to be a Harvard graduate to get into one of these um, companies. But I guess the reason why we did not simply say that is be due to the fact that um, there are ways, there are different ways to get there. Just your pedigree and where you're from and where you graduated from does not even come into play. It's like the hard work, the things you have to put into when just being at the right place at the right time. So um, Harriet has her hand up, so we'll let her speak to this. Yeah, um, I think part of what, oh, by the way, Malika is my sister, so just- <laughs> I figured, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I a little biased, but I think what she was, um, you know, part of my counter question to Menge was, trying to draw that out, right? Like, you know, just because you're from, you graduated from UTG doesn't mean that you don't have some of those skills already to succeed, right? And just because you graduate from Harvard doesn't mean you automatically get in either, right? I think for those of us who have taken the non-traditional path, um, you have to be super stubborn, right? Like, you can't just give up at the first sign of like something being hard. Um, you're going to cry a lot. <laughs> yep. um, you're going to cry a lot because like you're, you're not only a woman, right? You, a lot of us come to these spaces with like accents and, and like we're immigrants and like we're black and, and we're all these different like things that intersect, right? And, and we're trying to occupy these spaces where we don't have a lot of people who look like us, right? So that's gonna mean that you're a, a little bit more stubborn than most people, right? Like, and, and also you kind of don't give a fuck <laughs> a little bit, um, <laughs> kind of, you know? And you are a little, I, I like to think of myself as being a little bit petty um, as in like, um, I dare somebody to tell me I can't do something. Um, and the more you tell me I can't do it, the more I'm going to try to do that thing and be in your face about it. Um, so that comes with backlash sometimes, I think, because a lot of people don't expect women to occupy space. Um, a lot of people especially don't want black women occupying space. Um, and we are, when we're in these spaces, especially in technology, where in the United States, it's mostly white men who occupy these spaces, like as a black woman, like people take notice very quickly when you occupy a space that you're not supposed to occupy. So of course that comes with pains, right? And it's not just like technical aptitude, it's also, emotional intelligence that goes into that um, emotion and, and self-awareness, right? Um, because as you occupy these spaces as one or 
as the sole black woman or a token black woman, right? Like you need to be aware that you're not moving in a way that closes the door for other black women. Um, so I, I think that might be what um, my sister was alluding to a little bit earlier. Um, all of those things are difficult. Um, and those are skills that apply, I think, in Gambia as well, because for us, it's not necessarily tied to race as Gambians, but oftentimes um, the difficulty there is very much tied to gender, right? Gender-based um, discrimination, like as a woman in a highly technical, scientific, mathematical field, you're not supposed to be there, right? Um, you're supposed to be doing something else instead. Um, one of the more feminized, I guess, career paths. So, yeah. yeah. Definitely, yeah. I personally have never worked with anyone that looked like me, and I definitely look forward to days where I, like, work with people that look like me. Never worked with a Black woman before. So, yeah, I would like to speak to the whole interview process, but Yam has her hand up and um, Pierre has a couple of questions in the chat that we'll get to and then we can speak to the interview process. Go ahead, Yam. Um, I just wanted to circle back to something I had said earlier. Um, I think it was in response to Manga's question. And, um, and I, I had mentioned that one of the most significant things for me um, through this whole thing has been figuring out how I learn. And that is like, you know, I, I'm a visual learner. So making sure I use tools that are more suitable to visual, um, you know, visual learning has helped me um, just, you know, when, when, when I'm struggling with like content or something just to learn um, on, online, I would, I would try to find um, either like a different way of someone explaining it or um, a different kind of resource that, that le helps me visualize it better. So um, for me, you know, and that comes with a lot of like, like, like um, Harriet said, like self-awareness, emotional intelligence, and definitely um, a lot of grit. Um, sometimes you're gonna, you're, actually, yeah, I've, I've said I've given up a lot of times, <laughs> more times than I can count. Um, but at the end of the day, um, that is what it is. It is the willingness to learn. I, and, you know, learning comes with a lot of challenges because, you know, if you had already known it, you would need to learn it. Um, and, you know, the, the reason you're learning it is, it, it, you know, is because you need to step out of your comfort zone. And you need to grow. And that's always going to be challenging. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I, I definitely think that's, that's like a significant step. Um, For right sure. Now. Yeah, good point. All right, so Pierre says, given that the tech space is male dominated, um, did you face any roadblocks and how did you overcome them? So I feel like this is a good segue to that question. All right, I guess I'll... I, I could talk All right. about it. There we one. go, perfect. <laughs> I don't have to call out anyone. <laughs> <laughs> this is like one of my favorite things to talk about. Yes. Um, <laughs> every day is a struggle, I think, being a woman in tech, um, there are a ton of uh, everyday things um, that happen. Um, so it, for me, for instance, I've had multiple occasions where I'm clearly the lead on a feature or whatever that's being implemented, but people just like overlook me when they're having meetings um, having conversations, um, all of those things that happen. Um, so that's just one big example of um, a roadblock because it's um, something that will take a man very little effort, um, takes that much more energy um, for a woman to take care of and handle. Um, give me a second, please. No worries. Um, I'll take it from here. So um, as Harriet was speaking, I had like a specific example that happened to me. So I was working somewhere and then they hired a man and they asked me to like, you know, help him get up to speed, you know, learn the ropes and everything. And once he was 
you know, up and running, they promoted him to a position above me. And this has happened one too many times. So what I always do is, um, because I am fortunate to be in this country where um, the demand is higher than the supply for like, you know, um, seasoned software engineers, I always vote with my feet. If you don't hear me, if I speak up quite a few times and you don't listen, you don't hear me, I always vote with my feet. And I, it's it's unfortunate and it's the, something I would like to do because again, the uh, I would like to like stay and grow with a company and I would like to, you know, be comfortable and build a career somewhere. But again, if if the space is not something that's working for me and that's not jiving well with who I am, I always end up leaving. Yep. Um, uh, I think that's 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 a great tactic, honestly. And um, just like you said, I I have too many um, specific examples to even be comfortable with, but it really does come with um, a lot more, you know, and, and sometimes they can be so subtle, you don't even realize it, right? Yeah. It's like, so, so the current team I'm working with, for example, I'm currently the only woman on the team, and um, we work out of third-party data centers, so we would, like, we rent space from, like, you know, the building's basically run by someone who's on Google. And um, just recently, I, I went to one of our sites um, and the bathrooms, um, there's a woman's bathroom and there's a men's bathroom right next to each other. The first thing is you, the women's bathroom is not accessible. You have to go to security to get a key to open the women's bathroom. The men's bathroom doesn't even have a keyhole. Oh my goodness. When I asked, they said it was a management thing. So like in addition to my day-to-day -day work, I also have to keep an eye out for it, you know, just subtle things like that that affect me, you know, specifically as, as, as a woman. And it's like, I, in addition to your work, you have to, you know, fight for your like rights basically almost every day. Sometimes you have, to, you know, you have to work with this, um, avoiding this, angry black woman stereotype, you know, and, and just people assuming off the bat that you're incompetent, you know, assuming that you're the diversity hire, you know, yep. that, like, and yep. these things can be hurtful, but not only that, they have, they can have like financial repercussions, they can have health repercussions, and it's unfortunate, um, but I definitely support your way of doing it. Yeah, there's a lot of microaggressions that come with the workplace, and I feel like the first step is to make yourself aware of what these microaggressions are and to look out for them and then just, you know, build up a way to not let these get under your skin in a way to, like, fight them and push forward. Because more times than not, more often than not, um, with in comparison with my other coworkers, I tend to find myself speaking up and asking for things and pushing for things that I rightfully have to have, like promotions and, you know, raises and everything. So it's it's just a matter of like recognizing it before you can actually like fight against it and fight for what you actually have to have. I believe we have Harriet back. Yeah, I was going to talk about the money, like Mariam touched on it. That's one big, big way that I think a lot of women, not even just in tech, I think struggle, right, like day to day, um, is that women are often paid less. Um, I mean, I, I definitely have been in situations where I was essentially doing the work of many of my male co colleagues as well as my own, but I was earning significantly less than they were. Um, and I had to still prove that I was doing that work as if the product of my efforts wasn't enough proof. Um, but yeah, so like, I think one way as, as women to ensure that we are given the respect we deserve is always being aware of how much we are getting paid and demanding that we get paid um, as much as anybody else who's doing the same type of work. Um, yeah. Yeah, you, you talked on a good point there. Um, 
women, minorities, black people are usually paid or compensated based on like their, their past merits and some things they've already proven themselves. And white people are usually compensated based on their potential. So it's like, it's a lot of like, you know, upward battle in, in this space. And it's something that um, we, we have to talk about and we have to speak to more just so people can hear us. But there's like so few of us in this space, it's hard to at least actually make a dent in this conversation. But all right, let's move on to happier things. Um, Pear had another good question. He was like, also, can you share some of your success stories and key accomplishments in your respective domains, companies? Um, he's like, don't divulge any sensitive information. I've seen cases where women don't speak about their wins. Anybody want to start with a big W? I'll go. I like to All talk. All right. No. Love it. Go I'll for it. I'll be thinking later on. Okay, um, so I used to work for the Home Depot, um, which I don't know. I mean, I'm going to assume that most people are in the Gambia, um, but Home Depot is one of the big home improvement stores in the United States. Um, it's, it's a like billion Jim dollars. Huh? It's like Jim Pex. Jim Pex. I was going to say, like, yeah. Yeah. it's like Jim but worth a billion dollars plus. <laughs> um, and I specifically used to work in um, the IT sellings um, department um, for tool rental. And one of my big, big projects involved leading a team um, that brought tool rental to homedepot.com um, within certain pilot markets. And Home Depot had been trying to do that for about 20 years. They couldn't do it. But, you know, my leadership team, myself as, as team lead, made it happen. So, so if you live in Charlotte, North Carolina, that's one of the pilot uh, areas. You can go online and rent a couple of tools from Home Depot. And that was me. Amazing. <laughs> you got any personal wins you want to highlight? <laughs> Oh, no, badass. Ooh. Yeah. Um, do I? Honestly, um, the most recent win would be getting this job. Um, I had to learn skills from scratch. I had to take a couple of months just learning things from scratch, um, different skills, um, you know, improving my coding. Um, so to be able to get through that and get a I guess a, a win would be getting an exceeds expectations um, on my last performance review. Um, so, yay me. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it's hard to, like like you said, it's definitely hard to sometimes think about the wins when you're just trying to stay up every day. Um, so and thank you for even making me think about this. Um, but yeah, that would be my most recent win, I guess. That's huge. That's pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. Yeah, um, that's that's a powerful question, Pierre. I can't think of a recent win, um, <laughs> but I I guess it's um, so I started on my my team like a couple months ago, three months ago ish, and um, I already kind of have a new role in addition to like my current role. So I'm like fifty fifty on two roles right now because um, again started and then. Um, did not shy away from, you know, being visible, did not shy away from being, you know, vocal about what I'm able to do and everything on the team. So um, they gave me a role to like lead the entire org to make sure like everything that comes out of our entire organization is accessible. At least the UI is accessible to people that um, are hard of hearing, um, can't see, etc. like basically um, people with disabilities. So I'm super excited about that role because it's something that I've never like ventured out into. So a win, yes. <laughs> Thanks That's for asking amazing. that. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, yeah, so anybody else have any other questions? Um, Pierre is typing, but for now we can talk about the interview process. Let's 
Let's like scare people. Yum, how was your interview process? Oh boy, flashbacks. Um, my interview process, so I had four technical interviews, I believe. Yeah, so I had, no, I had three technical interviews and just one, you know, the behavioral thing. What did the technical you. interviews entail? Um, so I had one that was um, networking. Um, I had one that was Linux troubleshooting. And um, which was the other one? Hardware. Um, so because uh, currently, so what my job entails is just um, we deploy new um, new data centers or new new um, sites. Um, so we deploy new server racks, um, including the networking equipment, you know, um, so we also maintain them on a day-to-day -day basis. So got to fight with these servers every day. Um, try not to burn them down. But um, in, in, in essence, um, I, I, um, I like to say I work in the cloud. But yeah, the interview process. Um, so the three technical interviews were networking, um, Linux troubleshooting, and hardware. And um, they were all like, 45 minutes to an hour, I believe. Um, and yeah, they they would basically um, ask you. I, I, I did mine during the lockdown because of COVID, so I didn't do like in-person interviews. Um, so I did all of my interviews over um, video, video call. Um, so that was a little bit different. Um, but outside of that, it was it was OK as it 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 contained basically what I was expecting and what I had prepared for. Um, and I think for me, it was a little bit less um, nerve wracking because because I I was working for Google at the time, but in a different role. So I, I basically was already in tune with the culture in a way. So it was easier to talk to my interviewers like coworkers, you know what I mean? So that kind of took some of the edge off a bit. Um, but it definitely was a challenge. It was, it was, it was hard having to study for those, um, interviews while I was working full time. How um, long did finding, it take you to study for it? Um, two to three months, I believe. Yeah, it took me about two to three months, um, from prep to studying and I was studying every day. But what also helped was some of the stuff that I was studying, I was also doing at work. Um, so that that definitely helped a lot. But um, I also did a lot of mock interviews before, um, before, before my actual interviews. So that helped a lot. So I was able to um, speak to a few like former interviewers or even friends who've um, been in, in my position before. Um, because the, the, the person who actually referred me for this job um, was working in a data center in a similar role. Um, so um, I, I also had that, that part of preparation as well, having mock interviews and just having, you know, yeah, a network. And given that a company as huge as Google gets like 100,000 at least ap applicants a year, and then they notoriously have like a 1% <laughs> acceptance rate, did you have a backup plan? Um, yes and no. Uh, so my contract was ending at the time and COVID had just started lockdown. So, um, I, I wanted to actually initially apply for a software engineering role, um, but that would have taken me longer to prep for. Um, and that's basically why I, why I just changed my mind to this. So my backup um, was to apply for other roles as well. So at a time I had applied to, I believe, um, you can apply to like three roles at once. Um, so yeah, I did apply to three roles at once and um, I did the data center um, one first and I, I, I liked the transition it was giving me from my role then um, to, the, to the data center role, so yeah. Perfect, great. So, all right, Harriet, same question for you. You're also in a company, Netflix, that has a really low acceptance rate. They only take you if they know that you're a senior engineer and you know how to handle your stuff without any handholding. How was your preparation for that? 
Um, my so I actually like Netflix wasn't the company I was like going for initially. Um, not because of like anything. It's just like at first I I wasn't. First of all, the problem space was different for me um, because of course Netflix is in streaming as well as in um, content creation. So I, I had never done anything like that before. Like I didn't know anything about making movies or streaming services or anything like that. Um, I, I was applying from Home Depot, which is a retail company. So I had been in the retail space for a while. Um, before that, I was actually in a company called Sunbird. And um, funnily enough, um, Mariam, they make um, data center infrastructure management software. So like I had a little bit of that experience. Um, so I, I was trying to go for Facebook and Google. Um, those were my like top two and they rejected me and I cried a lot about it. <laughs> um, so it was very emotional. It was it was very dramatic. Um, I studied for like six months. Um, three of those months, I wasn't like studying like full time. I was kind of doing half hearted studying, and then three months of like studying every day, kind of like Mariam did. Um, the interviews were I think about three or four technical interviews. Um, uh, mostly data structures and algorithms types que type of questions, and then one system design question, um, and then some like behavioral interviews. So like, are you, you know, like making sure you're not a total psycho coming, trying to work for the company <laughs> kind of thing, and that you can actually get along with other people and, you know, you're not a total douchebag. Um, and that you fit in kind of. So um, that was basically the standard for like Facebook, Amazon, Google, Netflix. They pretty much have those very similar type of interviews. Um, and I did interview with Facebook, Amazon, Google, and Netflix. Um, I got rejected by Facebook and Google. I got an offer from Amazon and Netflix and I ended up um, accepting an offer from Netflix. So that was my experience. Awesome. So um, do you, can you share resources where people who are interested in innovating with um, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google that you talked about where they can go to to like get their feet wet and understand the entire interview process? Yeah, um, to get a feel for sort of what the technical in, like technical questions are like, um, I personally use LeetCode. Um, you can get the free version of LeetCode or you can get the paid version of LeetCode. Um, there are other similar uh, resources like LeetCode. Um, HackerRank is one of them, um, I believe. Algo IO is another one that I've heard like a lot of people talking about recently. Um, so those will give you a feel for a lot of the technical um, type of questions. Um, and then I also used um, Pramp, which is a free resource for conducting mock interviews. So you can actually like sign up for an interview, a technical interview, and you kind of get matched with somebody else. Um, so you'll spend um, half of the time interviewing someone and then um, the rest of the time is somebody else interviewing you. Um, you can select the type of interview you want, whether it's um, a data structures and algorithms question or it's a um, system designs question interview um, I believe they also have like product manager interviews also available on there. So that was a great resource for me to just sort of get my nervous energy out <laughs> before I did a lot of these like in-person interviews. Um, okay, another resource. Um, so recently I've discovered like this Facebook group for black uh, software engineers. Um, 
people do a lot of sharing on there. I can't remember the name of the group off the top of my head, but is it a black and tech group? Yeah, it, I think it might be. Uh, the, is it is it is it is it back by Facebook? I think Siren might be able to say something to that. But if it's the same that I'm thinking about, there's one that's called Black and Tech. Okay, so it's actually it's different. I think it's literally data structures and algorithms, black people and something like that. Um, anyways, that one I think might like if you're a ty- if you're the type of person who needs community to like kind of like you know, keep your motivation going. That's a good group to join as well. Um, it's also a good group to join because I see a lot of people asking questions about, hey, how did you guys deal with this problem or whatever? So I think that's great for forming community because you're going to need community when your mind is telling you that you cannot do it. Yep. <laughs> um, I, I had Umi and I had another friend um, when... I was studying for mine, and Umi remembers how much crying I did. So we uh, all did, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So, like, you're definitely gonna need a support group uh, if you're gonna try to do something like this. I think. Um, yeah. So those are a couple of resources. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, my story is also similar to Harriet. We studied together, and it was like. It takes a lot of rejection to finally get that acceptance, but then you, it, as much as I say, don't internalize it, you can't help but internalize it. But speaking from this perspective now, don't internalize it because it's, it's, it's a matter of luck as much as it's a matter of skill. So they all have to come together for it to happen. So, um, yeah, if you go through all the resources Harriet shared and Mariam shared in the chat too, um, just to, you know, get started. I feel like PRAMP is like a good place to get started to actually get a feel of like the interview questions and, you know, how the interview process goes and what kind of questions to ask. And um, in case anyone's wondering why it takes so long, if you're a working engineer, why it takes so long to prepare for an interview? Um, even though Yam said she was already doing stuff at work that were related to the interview, it's different for software engineers, um, at least from my experience. The questions you get asked from an interview are like stuff you did back in college. You can never remember that. And if you did not go do computer science in college, or you did computer science but never paid attention like me, um, you might get stumped. Or if you have not been to college in a while like me either, you might get really stumped. So it takes a lot of like preparation, going back to the basic, learning the different data structures and algorithms. And these questions are more like, um, in lack of a better word, I would say puzzles. So they would basically ask you um, a question without telling you how to solve it. And you have to think of like the best way to solve it. Um, thinking of like the time and space complexi- complexity. So thinking of like the computer memory and then how long it's gonna take for them to like get the results. So that's why it takes um, a bunch of times. And most of these com- companies usually have like five interview standards. So you have different interviewers interviewing you and then they all like write feedback and they all have to be like, you know, good-ish for you to like get through. So it, 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 it's a lot of like, it's a long process. It's a lot of screening and so uh, it, it's hard, but again, anybody could do it. Anybody could really. <laughs> All right, so um, I think we have a question from Mange in the chat. She says, uh, sorry. Yeah, oh, you had I just want to say something um, mm-hmm. to that. Uh, I, I think I, I skipped a I skipped a step where I got rejected by Google, so I did get rejected by Google. Um, the first time I think I was trying to convert to um, a full timer, and that's when I went to work for the um, startup. So yeah, the rejections are definitely gonna come and whoo, they sting, but yep, got to keep going. And um, Harry, you mentioned system design, and actually you've been getting into that recently. So those two. Um, sites have been um, are two that I am currently using. Um, I think I got an offer is free and um, they also have um, a feature to match you with like interviewers to do mock interviews and stuff like that. Um, And Algo Expert is uh, another one that Harriet mentioned and and it's one that I'm actually um, using as well currently for system design and that they do have a lot of like software engineering in like different um, fields as well. Perfect. Thanks Another, for sharing. 
thing for system design that I'm now actually realizing you can use leverage is just like GitHub, like scouring through open source projects on GitHub um, and just like starring projects that are there and open sourced and sort of looking through the code. Um, that's actually another great way to learn. Awesome. I, I did that a lot learning how to code. Uh, I I didn't. I, I didn't think of that for this. Thank you for that, Harriet. That's actually a great idea. What's the what's the name of the guy that um, has a really good system design um, page on GitHub again? Harriet? Don Martin? Yep, Don um, Martin. Mm -hmm. Just typing that in the chat. I've also come across this guy on YouTube who does like these very good system design um, um, videos. They're like very short, like 10 minutes, just especially for the basics, explaining basics. Um, there's like a whole playlist there. I think I mean, I'll find it and put it in the chat. Perfect, thanks. All right, Menga's question. She is like for young Gambians aspiring to make it to tech giants. What special specialization areas are on the up and up and they can start to learn and prepare for? So TLDR, um, if, if a young Gambian wants to join a tech giant, um, is there an area of specialization uh, that they can focus on right now to get in? All right, here. Um, I think it, like Mariam already mentioned, right? Like you have to kind of know yourself, right? Um, what, what do you really want to do in tech, right? Because we, we talk about tech as if the only option is to be like a software engineer or to be somebody highly, you know, math oriented or whatever, but that's actually not true. There's like space for, a lot of different types of people, a lot of different types of skills. Um, you know, like their UX designers are high in demand, right? In tech, people to actually sort of like research, right? The product that is being built out um, and figure out if it actually solves a problem. Um, and what the value proposition of something is. Um, there are product managers, there are project managers, there are software engineers, you know, like, and even within that large umbrella, right? You have UI engineers, you have people who only consider themselves backend engineers, you have database ad admins, you have um, people who are sysadmins, you, like, so it's like, what do you want to do, right? That's kind of the first question you need to ask yourself, like, what type of person am I and what do I want to do? Um, for me, like, I, I get bored very easily. Um, and I imagine that a lot of people who enjoy um, the technical side of things in tech are those types of people because like, because the landscape shifts a lot, like the technologies are different year over year. Um, you kind of, if, if you kind of have to like keep on top of things. So if you're a person who's stuck in your ways, like you're less likely to be adaptable in that way. Um, but if you're somebody who kind of always wants to like learn something new, that works for you. Like you don't really care what's changing, like you're just looking to like grow in that way. Um, so that that would be my first recommendation is to like find out what you wanna do. Um, and I know like a lot of people recommend, oh, learn ML, machine learning or AI or whatever. Um, I suppose that's great for future proofing your, <laughs> your skills as a software engineer because I suppose most of, most people consider that to be the wave of the future, but like people are always gonna need to do boring stuff too. So somebody's gonna have to code that boring stuff without ML either. So like just start where you can get in is my thing. Um, mm -hmm. No need to like overcomplicate things, like just start, right? Like, and then 
you can always grow into ML if that's what you want to do later. So, yeah, I think the skill most tested during the interview is the ability to like learn and pick up stuff and then the way you handle curveball. So that's like the biggest thing. So if it doesn't really matter at the end of the day what you learn, do you learn JavaScript? Do you learn ML? Do you learn something backend? Do you learn SQL? At the end of the day, the most important asset as someone in um, a computer science field is how quickly you can pick up something new and learn. Because things change so often. They change so often and you have to keep it up all the time. All right, yeah. Um, in addition to that, so um, while I was working tech support at Google, I my last year I was working at um, one of our Google Brain campuses. And it was just fascinating the different kinds of people that came up to tech support. And these are people I'd consider geniuses, right? And if there's one thing that they all had in common, the ones that I thought were like super smart, is that they were willing to learn. And they're also very comfortable in what they do not know. Yep. You know what I mean? And, and I think that speaks to Harriet's point about knowing yourself, is that knowing what you don't know is like the first step to learning or one of the first steps to learning because now you know what you need to focus on and it's like that willingness to let go of your ego and be like okay this is going to be hard it's not going to be easy because it's growth but it's that willingness to learn honestly like you said that that basically separates you know it shows you that you know these technical skills you know for the most part anyone can learn but it's like are you adaptable are you are you are you just gonna you know be like, okay, this is my expertise now. I'm not gonna learn the new, you know, frameworks or like, you know, when they are necessary. So yeah, I, I definitely think that's that's very important. Yeah, facts. All right, uh, we have about seven minutes to go. Does anybody have any question from the audience or want to speak up or just say anything? And you guys have asked like the best questions so far. So thank you for that. Okay, one last fun question. Mm -hmm. When y'all done kicking ass in like in these different companies, like when are you coming back? <laughs> uh, I'll let Harriet start with that. <laughs> I'm actually planning to move back in December for temporary, uh, basically a test period. Um, I'm trying to come back to Gambia for at least six months. So I'm trying to work with Netflix on what that would look like. Um, so yeah yeah that's 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 the exact reason why i wanted her to go first are you happy Menga? <laughs> all right well personally um yeah your question started with when you're done i'm not done yet but i'll be back <laughs> yeah ditto thanks <laughs> yeah i mean i definitely it, it i definitely do um you know want to go back want to give back and all of that but I feel like I'm still early in my career where there's a lot of things that I need to experience. There are a lot of things that I need to learn first before, you know, like just jumping into certain stuff. Um, just because it's Gambia doesn't make it any easier than, you know, any of the rest of the world. And well, that's one of the mistakes that people think, oh, it's Gambia, it's small, we can fix all of this today, yay. <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot, um, and, you know, that we need to know and need to figure out first. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely do think that I do want to do that eventually. It definitely is an experience. Yeah, totally. We want to give our best selves to the country versus like this half-ass person exactly. sitting here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Harriet, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was gonna say like, I mean, definitely for me, one of the things I am interested in um, and one of the things that drew me to this panel was the idea of like building a community around um, technology. But I think, you know, there are a lot of things that go into that um, because you can you can have the talent, right? But without the infrastructure, like what are we really gonna do, right? And that requires um, a lot of navigating political spaces that I don't know that a lot of people really care to do that. Um, that's certainly not, my purview or my desire um but i you know like i do believe that like 
you know, Africa is a breeding ground for a lot of different types of genius, right? Like we're there, we, we have, like, I mean, if you think about what we do as Africans with the few resources we have, like, damn it, we're awesome, right? Like we are amazing people, right? Like, but we don't look at ourselves that way, right? We just, we just focus on the not having and we always like make ourselves feel less for the not having rather than focusing on how we overcome a lot of things to be in the spaces we are. Um, so I think we do have a lot of potential, um, but we need to be supported in a lot of ways that we are not. So that's another conversation that needs to be mm -hmm. had. Yep. For sure. All Absolutely. Right. I think um, Harriet said something about um, just like having the infrastructure. And I think um, one of the things that I've realized just being in the tech space here is that one of the one of the things that we need to do um, in, in, in facing the, you know, issues home is that we need to shift our perspective. Um, we need to understand that we're not operating on the same level, like when it comes to the infrastructure and all of that, as the West. So if we're trying to apply Western solutions to our problems, it's it's like us or something. It's just not going to work. <laughs> yeah. Um, or if it does, it's going to be at a at a huge cost. Um, and that's what I personally think. Um, so I do I do think there's definitely value in in you know, keeping, keeping our, our perspectives, you know, just from that, that angle, um, and, and just keeping that in mind, um, that, you know, we're in vastly different, different, um, places when it comes to, like, just infrastructure-wise and resources and all of that. Yeah, definitely. All right, last call for questions before we wrap this up. I see someone typing in the chat. Um, but yeah, so any final words, ladies? Um, sorry, one, one sorry, one last question for Harry. Um, yeah. I was typing, but I guess I'm a little bit slow. Um, <laughs> but, uh, question uh, for Harriet. I know there's a lot of, uh, as you already know, content is the new oil, that's what they say. Um, and I, and I've been hearing a lot of talk, um, on Netflix plans to come to Africa and, and tap into that con uh, content, new content. Um, wh what do you think is in the pipeline? And as, as an African being here, how can, you pre how can you prepare for an opportunity like that? What are some of the areas you guys are looking in, um, looking at, if, if those are not sensitive information for sure? No, I, mean, I don't think that's necessarily sensitive. Um, I think it's out there if you know where to look for it. Um, so I think one of the things that Netflix is trying to do is, um, as we all know, Netflix is producing content at a rate that most traditional studios have never produced content in. Um, so I'm, I'm new to the space. So a lot of these things are actually surprising to me as well, but like a lot of studios, you know, like ho in Hollywood, for instance, you know, they may come out with, let's say, five things a year, right? But Netflix is like producing hundreds of like movies and shows at any given time, right? So that not only requires talent, whether it's like actors or, or whatever, but it also requires other types of talent as well, like the behind the scenes talent. So like people who are technical, um, what are they called? The, the lighting folks, right? Um, people who are visual effects artists, people who are animators, like these are all things that go into making movies and TV series and cartoons and stuff. And Netflix is making all of those. Um, so in order to meet that demand, Netflix is tapping into the global talent market. Um, whereas a lot of traditional studios tap into local markets for their talent. So that's why they're expanding into Africa, expanding into Asia, basically expanding everywhere. So I would say that in order to take advantage of this, if you are somebody who 
is a comedian, if you are somebody who is a sound engineer in Africa, like these are all valuable skills that we need to keep emphasizing, right? Because it's not just about being a doctor or a lawyer or a software engineer, it's also about other things, right? Like at the end of the day, as human beings, like creativity feeds our soul um, and we need all these different types of talents to make that happen. So um, yeah, that's what it's about, basically. Go do all the things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just do what you can do and what you want to do, but do it with pride and do it with passion. And all that's right. the way to end it. <laughs> all right, good. Well, thank you so much, ladies. Any final words? I just want to say thank you to all of you. And um, this has been such an enjoyable um, chat. Definitely looking forward to connecting um, with, you know, with people. I'm on LinkedIn, um, I think on Facebook. Um, so yeah, connect on LinkedIn, something. Um, it was nice being here and answering your questions. Thank you. Do you want to throw your, um contact details or whatever on the chat if in people chat, want to reach okay, out to I'll, you. I'll grab my link, sure. All right. Abdul, do you have a question quick before we move on to Harriet's final words? Yeah, so I was actually trying to send a message through the chat, but I couldn't get through. Oh. Just want to thank you guys for hosting this event. I mean, it was very insightful. And Harriet, you guys are indeed very amazing. Um, I do have a question, though. What... Um, I mean, I guess it's, you know, it's really a big deal for you guys to get to where you are now. Um, and a lot of inspiring, you know, Gambian kids in, in, you know, in school now who are undecided as to what, you know, what field they want to pursue. Um, are you guys considering mentoring any upcoming Gambians, either, you know, boys and girls, college and high school? So they can, you know, make the right decision, or you know, guide them through navigating the college life and picking the right majors. I think that would be really helpful. That's a really good question, Abdul. I'll I'll get I take I'll take a stab at it. Um, only because I would have really benefited from having a mentor super early when I was starting out. Only because I took a a lot of turns to get where I was. So um, just to give you perspective, I initially studied sociology, literature, and French. And then I was like, I'm bored two years in. And I'm like, I want to do something else. I am super interested in like media communication. And I started studying that. But then I looked up the salaries. I'm like, uh, yeah, the college tuition is too high to be paid this little. So I was like, I like talking. I'm going to be a lawyer. And then I got in and I was like, oh, eight years of school. I don't think I can wait that long to start earning money. And, and you get the flow, right? I wanted money. So um, I spoke to the advisor in school and they were like, um, they were trying to like gauge what I was really good at. And eventually they were like, um, are you interested in IT? I'm like, well, I'm really good with like tech stuff. So they asked, um, do you know any languages? I was like, yeah, I'm excited. I know a lot of languages. I'm like, yeah, I know English. I know French. And I started going on. They were like, no, do you know like Java and like .NET? I was like, no, I don't. So they were like, well, um, you when you do computer science, you get to learn languages. And that's the only reason I signed up. I thought I was going to learn more languages. But I started off and I, I found it challenging and I found it interesting and kept me going. But I felt like if I had a mentor earlier on, I would have not had to like waste a lot of years trying to figure out what I wanted to be and who I wanted to do. So um, to your question, yes, I personally would like to like mentor people, but it's hard to find um, Gambians who are interested in this. Uh, I'm probably not sticking out in the right avenues, but I'm, I'm super open to it and I'll be really happy to like mentor people. But um, I always keep telling myself my, my, my presence is like a form of, you know, protest is like a form of like showing people that this is available to you. If this, you know, random kid from Canifin can do it, I guess you can too. 
Shout out to Estate Kid. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sarah, I think you're muted. <laughs> you are muted. Sir, you're muted. Serene, you're muted. Yeah, still. Yeah. Um, I I guess I I'll, I can talk about mentorship. I mean, yeah. that's definitely something I'm interested in. Like when I was alluding to community building, I think that's definitely one way to build a tech community in Gambia. Um, and I know that ITAG, shout out to ITAG, has been doing a lot of that work. Um, Beran has been awesome. Sitting, both the sittings. Um, <laughs> They're living up to their well. names. <laughs> doing lots of that work as well um so i i'm currently actually mentoring somebody um but it's not through like any gambian program it's actually a uk black girls in tech um program um and i'm definitely like interested in doing more of that so i would love to see more um, black ambient girls. I mean, no offense to the voice, but yeah, I would rather see more girls and <laughs> in tech. Um, so yeah. All right, let's close oh, it up. I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I forgot. I, I I don't think I did mention that. Yes, I am open to mentoring. I actually need to reach out to Umi and Harriet um, for some mentoring myself. Uh, uh, like I said, I've been getting into system designs and the system design, um, and it seems like you'll know, be the perfect people to talk to about that. So I'll be reaching out, please and thank you. Yeah, we'll be happy to. Thank All you. right, final word, Harriet. Um, about oh yes, tech is awesome. You guys are even more awesome. Um. If you ever think that you can do something, like there are thousands of ex um, examples out there that will show you that you can do it. Um, so there's, a, if you believe in something enough, you know, like you gotta be willing to do the work to get it done. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. All right, I am just gonna say, these ladies said it all, and we truly appreciate you guys' presence and you guys' interest in this um, topic, because to speak for both Yam and Harriet, um, as much as we're passionate about tech, we are more passionate about, you know, highlighting the plight of women and, you know, advancing the plight of, like, Gambian women specifically. So we truly appreciate all the good questions and, you know, the audience and everything. So thank you so much. All right, Saren, you got anything to say? <laughs> oh, he's muted. <laughs> uh, Umi, you were an amazing host, by the way. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, uh, looks like Saren Yomar permanently doesn't have a mic, so I guess we'll wrap this up. <laughs> he looks so confused. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. Cool, thank you so much, Wait. everyone. <laughs> Can he maybe type in the chat if he wants to say something? Saying, you want to type in the chat? I don't know. Love the session. You're all amazing. <laughs> Thank you for putting it together. You are amazing. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Have a great rest of your weekend. Y'all stay easy. Bye.